Welcome, everybody. My name is Jen Lawrence. I've met lots of you. I'm the executive director of the Hideo Sasaki Foundation. Welcome to our mid-grants presentation for the current design grant cohort. We are so excited to hear what they've been working on. Um, at the Sasaki Foundation, we believe that design has the power to address the most urgent challenges facing us, from social equity to mobility connections and community health to environmental resilience. Design is an agent of change, and yet access to design, especially for the communities who often need it the most, is limited. Our work aims to amplify the voices of historically underrepresented communities, and to achieve impact, we host programs around three pillars. Oops, sorry, I should have shown this one first. The three pillars are research, public programming, and design education. Through these pillars, we sponsor community-based research and actionable projects in our region through our design grants program. We sponsor community, we create space for dialogues that highlight important topics to advance advocacy for social justice and resilience. And we provide design education opportunities for youth. And there's lots of reps here today, so speak to our youth representatives and Shamar. The design grants prompt is shared voices, charting a course for community action. The focus areas include proactive approaches to climate adaptation, new models for housing, innovation in transit and mobility choices, creative community building, and innovation in health and well being. The challenges in addressing environmental resilience, displacement, affordable housing, access to mobility choices, meaningful public engagement, and other social equity considerations in planning and design are so broad and complex. They require a shared approach to facilitate all the necessary conversations and deliver those actionable solutions. Multiple futures are at stake and we can make a difference by acting now. So today I am honored to present the work of the current design grant cohort. And I see Melissa up here. We're going to start with see you in the future. Hi, Melissa. So why don't you, oops, hold on. It's not letting me go forward. Um, why don't you go ahead and see if you can share your screen and hopefully you can. I cannot. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me stop this share and see if that works. Can you now? Oh, yes, I can. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to mute myself and go ahead and share your screen and we'll, we'll see your project to date. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Um, for having us. I'm here with my teammate, George Hathkenny, um, and we are here representing our project, See You in the Future. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this to 15 minutes. Um, we have some video and audio to share with you all today, um, so sorry in advance if it goes over time. Um, so See You in the Future, um, our goal is to build uh, storytelling capacity with folks on the ground. Um, for us, we're working with folks who are um, mostly unhoused or um, using drugs or um, and or have some form of mental illness um, to assist in telling counter narratives about care, community and welcoming spaces um, in the mass and cast area, um, as well as to better advocate for their needs. Um, so this is the outline of um, our presentation today. So first I'll start with um, why we want to focus on storytelling and then go over our process, um, some of the research we've been doing, and then share some conversations. And finally, most recently, some of the workshops we've been doing and um, reflections. Um, so. Thank you to the Sasaki um, designers and artists um, and planners for helping us with this graphic. Um, we wanted to just show 
why storytelling is so important for us and why we see it as a um, tool for advocacy and um, social change. Um, so for folks who don't know um, about Mass and Cass and the, its history, um, it be, we wanted to chart how this area became such a public symbol of crisis and broken systems um, in the Boston region. Um, so in 2014, um, the bridge to Long Island was um, closed um, and it basically cut off access to this campus, recovery campus that was on the island and forced 700 people um, to move overnight. Um, and many of them landed in the area that is now known as Mass and Cass. Um, and you can see in this timeline, um, pretty quickly, the news started covering the area. It became known as the Methadone Mile. Um, and um, the news, um, all of the stigmas, all of the negative stigmas that surround um, drug use, um, homelessness, mental illness, are shown through the way that this area is covered in the media. Um, at the same time, um, members of our team, Sabrina and Steve, at that time were working in the city of Boston, and they um, worked with different organizations to create um, a place called the Engagement Center. Um, you can see a photo of it here um, that really tried to be a welcoming space for folks who had landed in this area and um, needed a place to go between when shelters kicked them out in the morning at 7 a.m. and when shelters allowed some people back in at 7 p.m. Um, and um, yeah, and then we wanted to show that despite all of the effort that designers have made to create this kind of welcoming space for people and to design these spaces with people, um, because of the negative news coverage which influences public perception, um, neighbors' perception, policymakers' perception, um, it became really hard for designers and staff on the ground to do their job. Um, and so uh, for us, we wanted to focus on um, the closure of the engagement center, which is now a brick and mortar building um, in April of 2022, after there was reported, um, reported stabbings in the building. Um, and we wanted to differentiate between like the reported violence and the reality because there is violence on the streets. Of course, that happens when you live um, without like many resources and you know with tension. But um, because the stabbings were reported, um, people felt like they needed to respond and they overcorrected and closed the engagement center. Um, so, so far, um, what we've tried to do is focus on just building, sorry, <laughs> focus on building relationships and just being present, getting to know people, um, things like mutual aid, volunteering with existing organizations, um, going to events, and um, yeah, and just trying to be helpful for people who are already uh, doing this work and have been doing this work. Um, having a lot of unrecorded conversations as well as recorded conversations with people who live there or work there or just care about the area and people, um, as well as learning about the history of policies and interventions and the media narratives, um, as well as their impact on the community. Um, so I'll show you a few of the data visualizations we've created to um, try to start sharing some of the research we've been doing and then later talk about the programming that we've just started to try to reactivate the engagement center. Um, okay, so one thing that we have been trying to document is um, how the um, landscape of, how the streets of Mass and Cass have changed in relation to how the story of the area has changed. Um, so we see in 2014, before the Long Island um, Bridge was shut down, the area of Mass and Cass is, there doesn't look, there isn't anything about it that's, you know, 
alarming. Um, and then over time, um, we see as more people are in the area who are using, um, actively using or unhoused, um, you start to see the dismantling of public infrastructure. So the loss of the bus um, station bench, as well as like banners, decorations, um, the, the loss of the entire bus station itself, the bus stop, the installation of cameras, um, and then um, behind the tents, you can see like the installation of stronger uh, and taller iron fences. And um, this, we see this pattern mirrored in other places in the neighborhood. Um, similarly, in 2009, you had um, more green, greenery <laughs> kind of, um, but then you see that these are lost over time as the space is disinvested in. Um, you also see um, infrastructure that is there. If it's broken, it's not replaced by better ones. Um, more fences and also, oops, and also you start to see the introduction of more police presence, though it's not in this picture. Um, we wanted to share. Let me see if I have time. Um, I'm going to share a short video just to show some of the audio that we've been collecting and some of the footage that we have of the streets. Come on and walk and talk with the sheep. Can you walk and talk and hear me? Hello, Marky, Nick, Brandy, and Matt T. We're under siege by my neighbor Seal with a Johnny boy. I don't tell people goodbye. I just tell them, I'll see you again, because I always do see them. I've been living on and off homeless since I was like 14. Mass and Cass particularly uh, since 2017. When I first started going down there, everyone helped everyone. You know, people robbed everybody, but everyone was there for each other. You know, you, you all had each other's backs. Waking up after a good night's sleep feels good. Getting out of my tent, stretching. Lighting a cigarette and sipping on cold camp coffee. Eventually I moved to a motel, where I spent a short time before moving to a room. It lasted eight months, this room. However, I don't know. Was it because I was older? It seems that the older I get, the longer I last in housing situations. Like, a lot of people don't like shelters, but I kind of feel like me and my friend created Tent City. You know, we, we it all started with a Pine Street blanket and a tarp. You know, just sheltered ourselves, but we, we adapted and it turned from a blanket over our head to a tent. And then it turned into a tent, to a business tent. You know, because I had to survive, so I was selling sodas and all that out of my own little campground. And then people just adapted from that. They saw me do it, and they, they started doing it too. Um, I'm going to pause it there for time. Um, but this is a, a rough cut of trying to pull together some of the audio and video we have, but we, we wanted to just balance people's realities and living on the streets in this area that is not, um, you know, that is actively hostile um, with moments of creativity and beauty um, and poetics that also are a part of their everyday life, um, while not, you know, romanticizing their experiences. Um, and then in the last few minutes, I just want to show, um, we started to host art workshops in the Engagement Center um, a few weeks ago, and this was in response to people just um, being really excited about um, having programming that really engaged people um, in a creative way, and they really emphasized, um, just make sure you're consistent, regardless of whatever you do, we need you to show up because the last um, since COVID, there have been so many changes, three different mayors, 
Um, mass and caste has been painted as this huge problem. A lot of different interventions have been tried, and it's each time people's livelihoods that they've built on the streets get disrupted, and there's been a lot of broken trust. So we're trying to just show up, keep asking people how we can improve, um, and hopefully go from these art workshops towards talking with people about what do you think about um, your experiences in the EC, in the engagement center, as well as on the streets. How can we work with you as designers and artists to reimagine things, connect you to other people and resources, and work on this together as um, co-designers? Um, so I just wanted to share a few of the things that have come out of our um, workshops. So we asked people, what could you change on the streets? Um, and gave them like a something to color. Um, so people talked about like more infrastructure, things like more bathrooms, more medic tents, um, more spaces for people to go that are 24 seven, um, instead of, you know, needing to wait for the engagement center to open and then leave when it closes at night. Um, yeah, similar. Um, just ideas as well as just people talking to us and coloring um, to, yeah, feel like, um, yeah, to have a little more fun beyond just sitting there and watching TV. Um, and so these are some of the things we've been thinking about um, as we go forward. So as designers, how do we think about, as designers and planners, like how do we think about the value of rumors and uh, information that's not recorded and the, and the legitimacy of that versus, um, you know, always valuing data. Um, and so we get a ton of information that's valuable with just people telling us things that doesn't end up getting recorded. So I think we're thinking about how do we, what is our role in that and how do we treat it um, ethically? The value of consistency, um, the, the value of wonder in the activities that we're bringing in, um, where creativity lies, um, yeah. thinking about how people talk about like how, ways that they already show creativity, and then, and also just the subtle ways that people are dehumanized and how it weighs on people spiritually, like when people are referred to as those people um, by all sorts of people. So, um, yeah, that's that's the end of the presentation. Um, would love your thoughts, questions, um, and yeah, I have George here to help field the hard questions. Wow, thank you so much, Melissa and George. That was incredible. Um, and you, yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> you do. Does anybody have a question? I'll just bring the mic over to you so you can be heard by them. And I think, Melissa, you all have to leave relatively soon, right? Um, yeah, in the next okay. 10, 15. Okay, cool. So if more questions come up and that you that you think of later on, um, and Melissa's still here and George is still here, we can we can ask then, or you can give them to us and we can get them to them for you. Thank you so much. That was incredible. No last minute questions? Okay, perfect. So next, um, thank you, Melissa. We are thank going you. to, let me share my screen. Um, we are going to bring up. Oh, there is a chat. Great, thank you. Okay, so the chat's Melissa. I love the drawing coloring activity of integrated. It seems so interesting and wonderful for getting meaningful input, also beautiful illustrations. And then I'm curious, how has the community responded to your work? Do we have time to answer? Or Absolutely, yes. Um, George, you wanna take that? You've been talking about it for a while. Sure. Um, well, it's been it's been a really good response uh, because I don't know how many people are familiar with that area, but it's composed of a jail, 
two methadone clinics, two shelters, Boston Medical Center. It's just really dense um, with unhoused people, folks looking for a mental health help. So they feel like they have not been heard so far. And so an opportunity to not only like sort of do something different um, and get away from the everyday, but also to feel like their voices are gonna be heard and that they matter has been great. Um, we, we haven't had anything, um, I haven't had anything but positive responses from, from everyone that uh, we've either interviewed or done workshops with. Thank you, I, I did have, sorry. Oh no, go ahead, Melissa. Just to add a counter, not, it's not extremely positive response we've gotten. Um, I do think that some people have, um, I think they're very hesitant because they're like, who are you? What is your role? What can you, what can you really do? Um, and I see that as just because of the, the broken trust in, in the kind of um, relationship with outside people. Um, I think we have to also be really careful to not overpromise what we can do um, and not overstate, I think, um, what we mean when we say co-designers with people. Like we're, we want to engage them and really help, you know, like do what we can to lift up their voices and build capacity. But also we're like a team of four people <laughs> working part time on this. So um, I think people have been rightfully um, skeptical also at times. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions? One more on chat. Hold on. As a follow-up, I'm curious, in an optimistic way, where do you think this will lead? You want to take it, George? I feel like you're more optimistic. <laughs> I am more optimistic. And uh, full disclosure, I come from that space. So I was down there myself. Um, and now I'm working as a, a certified peer specialist. Uh, come sort of sort of coming back. So so I see I've I've been through the journey myself, um, and everyone's not the same. But I really do believe in in the power of anchoring onto something that's other than um, to get you through. So hopefully this will lead to uh, more civic knowledge around people who are making decisions for about how these folks move and where they where where they will live. Um, I think that uh this administration anyway has been um willing to to try new things and i think that this is something that um hasn't been done before and that the people that we quote unquote serve also have a voice in how their experiences are so whether you're talking about health and human services or architecture and design i mean to have that input it's just a different way of, of doing things. So I, 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 am, I am optimistic, hopeful. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And on that hopeful note, uh, thank you. And we're gonna move on to the next group. And if there are any other questions that come up, feel free to email myself or Anna and, and we'll send those over to the group. Oh, a couple more chats, hold on, maybe we're done. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna move on to Chinatown Energy Literacy Campaign, and they are here, so come on up. Um, trying to figure out, I might just go, here we go, so that people on the screen can see, well, they can do what they can do. Go in a chat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. And then just make sure. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Maisie and I'm with um, a nonprofit called Climable with my colleague Caroline and we're in the community energy space loosely. Um, and we're here with our partners from Chinatown Community Land Trust and Chinatown Power, Sorry and Lydia. And we're here to tell you about our project today, which is the Chinatown Energy Literacy Campaign we are creating with the support of the Sasaki Foundation. Do I move it on? Uh, 
Um, great. So, perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. So, we, as I said, together we're creating a, an energy literacy campaign for the Chinatown community, which is mainly to provide educational materials and resources that will give the community members um, some information on energy democracy, as well as empower them to participate in energy conversations, um, which is really important because there is this is a carve out of a larger project to build an microgrid in the Chinatown community, which I will let. Sure. Um, so uh, Chinatown has a lot of environmental burdens. Um, it's got the highways coming through that contribute to some of the worst air quality in the state. Um, it has, uh, it's the hottest neighborhood in Boston uh, with a lot of impermeable uh, surfaces and it is um, at high risk of flooding as uh, sea levels rise and the risk of um, large storms increases due to climate change. Um, it's also home to a pretty large low income immigrant community. Um, so uh, this population is um, especially vulnerable to these types of uh, health uh, impacts that are uh, affecting them. So um, part of the purpose of this campaign is to educate them um, about these uh, things that many of them you know, may take for granted or accept as facts as facts of life, uh, where we try and you know educate them about you know things that can be done to address them. Some of which uh, is our work on the microgrid, uh, which is a virtual community microgrid uh, targeted uh, at low-income housing. We're uh, looking to uh, improve the energy efficiency of these buildings, um, add resilience measures like batteries and solar uh, panels. Uh, where possible. And so we're, we're walking through these buildings and having conversations with tenants um, about what kind of changes they'd like to see while also talking about, you know, what kind of changes can help improve the neighborhood. But, um, I'd also add we're doing some open space work with, you know, Yeah, so just quickly, I'll walk through a bit of a high level uh, overview of what we're going to be doing in the next coming months. Um, so far, and we'll continue to until May, craft an energy literacy campaign, um, digital reels material. They're like infographics that will cover relevant topics on environmental pressures, as well as energy topics for the Chinatown community. And these will live eventually on a web-based platform that will be a bit of a resource hub for uh, different residents to go to. And at this, that's what Climable will be doing. And then our Chinatown Community Land Trust and our partners are collecting community input and interviews that will also live on this resource hub. And then come mid-April, we'll begin to design a web-based platform with the Sasaki designers um, where all of this can live. And we hope to be able to have various resources on this in different interactive styles so that learning can be an exciting opportunity. Um, and then, oh, it worked, okay. And then we have some updates. Um, thus far, our groups have been meeting together bi-weekly to discuss different um, things we're doing, um, such as our reels, which we now have a few drafts of. Um, and this is just some examples that you can see here in the middle. Um, oh, and we went to the design charrette that Sasaki held and do you guys want to talk about some of the things you've been doing, like the open space and the EJ workshops? So in designing the energy literacy campaign, one of the questions that we started with is, um, what does resilience mean for the community? And uh, part of our work in Chinatown has been getting residents together, particularly in affordable housing developments, to talk about the whole topic of resilience as well as environmental justice. Um, we were particularly interested in energy justice because of the microgrid project that we're doing that um, Sari spoke about. And also because we know that there's a lot of interest, like people don't know how to read their utility bills. And uh, when we introduced, you know, do you know what you're, how to read your utility bill as part of this workshop? You know, we got a big response about that. Um, but we also realized that, you know, when we talk about uh, 
climate threats, issues of the heat island effect, um, and things like that. There are a lot of other aspects of um, people's lives that they think about, you know, in, in terms of dealing with some of these issues. So we've been talking a lot about open space in particular, or the lack of open space in Chinatown. Um, and these workshops have become kind of more general environmental justice workshops, um, but which through which we are involving people in organizing and visioning around uh, future open space that we hope to advocate for, expand and improve, but also um, helping us to uh, really figure out how to make the microgrid project meet residents' needs. Um, so I'm gonna briefly go over the project outcomes. Um, so just to start off with the physical outcomes that we hope to get from this project, um, a complete set of educational reels, like the ones that were shown before. Um, the topics of these reels will range from historical and current environmental injustices in Chinatown, uh, their in specific impacts on the community and solutions that can be provided by a community microgrid. The reels will be in plain, easy to understand language in both English and Chinese. Additionally, um, we hope to have a website that will be the home to these reels and other resources that promote environmental and energy literacy and community involvement. Um, lastly, we hope to have increased awareness and enthusiasm in the community for environmental and energy justice issues uh, and the microgrid project. So specifically so far, uh, the EJ workshops have uh, found eight multi-family housing buildings that will be included in phase one of the microgrid and we hope to further this project. Um, and then the project impact, using these physical outcomes, we hope to directly impact the community in numerous ways. For example, increasing community knowledge on the EJ issues in Chinatown, understanding the implications of being an environmental justice neighborhood, which Chinatown is. We hope to improve energy literacy and utility customers, kind of like how Lydia uh, said before, such as how to read and understand a utility bill, and energy efficiency and how it affects affordability. Um, we hope to promote change and provide info for the community members on how to take action, increase awareness and interest in environmental justice energy issues and solutions and provide resources for um, some of the hazards of the community such as extreme heat, power outages, flooding and so on. And lastly, most of all, we hope to increase enthusiasm for the microgrid project. Uh, so that's it. Thank you so much. Um, any questions are welcome at this time. Thank you. And what do we have for questions out here? And I'll monitor the chat as well. Oh, yes. Um. Um, so at the end, you talked about wanting to have a website to like post all these reels. What's your method for um, promoting the website and like sharing it so that you'll get like a bigger audience? Yeah, so uh, we hope to like at the um, community meetings and just community centers, uh, areas around Chinatown, we hope to provide physical um, copies of these reels and then also maybe have like a QR code or just have these available at um, high, like high traffic areas in the community that uh, is easily accessible. So basically QR codes. Um, and also the thing, the one of the qualities of our reels is that we hope to have them in multiple formats so they can be printed out it can be digital online on social media, um, shared in WeChat, uh, and different, basically transferable from that. Um, how is it that you are uh, engaging people that may not understand this kind of topic? Because I feel like energy microgrids are relatively a new concept that we're trying to like 
introduce the people so how how are you doing that and how effective has it been so far yeah so i mean we kind of frame it around uh their energy bills talk about um we start with like what they know, like their electric bills. And then we, we start talking about, well, this is what this charge is for that. This is what this charge is. And then we kind of frame it around, well, you know, we can make this change, this piece of equipment, like uh, your air conditioner, and that'll reduce your electric. And, um, kind of, without getting too technical, we focus on the broad idea of, you'll have this backup source of power, you can switch back and forth. Um, to the backup source or the grid, so you'll still be connected. Um, and well, we frame it around the idea of savings as well. So uh, just basically, we talk about how the utility will pay, uh, will offer a lot of incentives for people not to be using their electricity when uh, the grid is at peak demand. Um, and I think people have been able to grasp it fairly well. I mean, I think it's it's just kind of understanding what people's own experience is. And um, initially, actually, when we started, when we were in the the feasibility phase, we talked a lot about the threat of flooding and how um, what happened to people in New York City, Chinatown during the, the um, Hurricane Sandy, because a lot of people in Chinatown in New York City were affected and uh, people Chinese people read the news about other Chinatowns all the time. <laughs> so everybody knew that that lots of people were stranded in these um, in their apartments, especially the elderly um, after Hurricane Sandy because of losing power, even though power got turned on right away in Wall Street next door. Um, so we talked about that as an example, but in a way, and, and I think that people got the idea of, you know, we want to have backup power and we want people to be able to power on and off the grid, you know, which also can be um, good for the environment and good for savings. But I, what's interesting is actually in the last year or two, um, we realized that what's much more um, Im immediate to people is the heat um, because we just had such a bad heat wave last summer and uh, Chinatown tenants are some of the most vulnerable residents in the city because the heat in Chinatown can be like, you know, 10 degrees more than in other parts of the city. And a lot of people in the in um, the less modern housing don't have any cooling, you know, or if they have anything, they have a very inefficient window AC. So this has been another way that we've been talking with people about the benefits of energy efficiency and new technology and you know that um, one of the things that we're hoping to bring to a lot of buildings is efficient heat pumps that can provide both heating and cooling. Um, and in a way that's more immediate to people than power outages because Chinatown actually luckily so far has not had a lot of power outages, but people understand that that's you know one of the, the roles as well. Lydia, could I jump in for a second too on that point? Okay, cool. Um, if I understood the question, you're talking about how to make these topics like easier for people to understand. And I know that uh, like our Chinatown partners are handling the, the in-person communication, but in terms of the written materials that we've been working on, we work really hard to just distill it to the, its simplest, essence when we're trying to communicate a message like rather than use the terms urban heat island necessarily we're, we're we have a picture of a sun that's pretty you know simple to understand and we're using the word hot and hotter you know so just putting things in the in the plainest language um is what climbable works to do and it's crazy how much we agonize over wording to make sure that we are capturing the essence of ideas um and then making sure that it's available in multiple languages is our the other technique that we we work in there to get language justice. Um, and then just wanted to add on to, to Lydia's point, 
Yes. Like always bringing it back to people's experience so that it isn't like an esoteric topic, like bringing it home. You remember how hot last summer was? Well, this is how it impacts you. And that's kind of how we help make those connections because energy is so invisible. Um, so that's kind of how we approach it. And just also Jen put in the chat. Thank you. Also for the previous question um, that we could, we are concurrently working to brand Chinatown power as an organization like the new logo in the slides and that helps with the name recognition. So it's Chinatown power CCLC at CCLT is Lydia's group and climbable have an active social media presence as well. So it's a very multifaceted engagement. Thing. We have time for one more. Yes, Tao. Um, you might have covered this already while I was eating. I was wondering when you mentioned microgrid, what's the source of energy? Is that uh, visible uh, in, in the community or somewhere around Boston? Thank you. Um, so we'd be installing batteries that would still be connected to the grid. So they'd still be drawing ever uh, power from ever sources grid or um, solar rooftop solar. Um, and we're, we're, we're kind of assessing it on a building by building basis as they all have different uh, the roofs in Chinatown. Thank you. That was really great clarification. Uh, thank you very much. And any other questions, feel free to email us, same as before. Thank you. Okay, so next. We're going to move on to Emily at Groundwork Somerville. I saw you on earlier. And Emily, do you want to share a screen or are you just going to talk? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Okay, great. I just stopped sharing so you should be able to. Okay, great. Okay, um, so I'm Emily. I'm the Food and Farms Director over at Groundwork Somerville, and we'll be talking about our project. Um, so we are a nonprofit um, in Somerville that has been changing places and changing lives since 2000. So our mission is to cultivate the next generation of environmental leaders to grow more equitable Somerville. Um, we currently manage about a quarter acre urban farm where we grow produce for the community, employ about 15 um, high school students every summer um, in a green jobs program. And then we also have K through 12th grade field trips and involve our community in the local food system through community events and volunteering. So um, our, the project that we've been working on is to develop and design a new farm space as um, our farm is going to need to, to move to a different location in the next three to five years. So just to show you, this is um, back in 2011, what the space looked like before it was a farm. It was right next to um, just a used um, junkyard car lot and um, with the help of our high school green team members it was transformed into a really beautiful urban farm space um, where community members can gather. Um, we are focused on growing culturally relevant produce and so have a partnership with the city of Somerville and a mobile farmers market and so we do surveys for the community and ask folks what food maybe they can't find at the grocery store um, that feels like home to them. And that's important for their sense of belonging and um, just for their health and well-being. And so we're not a large space, but we're able to experiment and introduce new crops into the market in hopes that um, some larger farmers will um, say, hey, oh, you're growing Gilo. Um, there is a, a demand and an interest in this um, <clears throat> in this produce. We're going to start growing that. This is um, just an image of kind of the expanded site. So this is just down the street. So we have these two different urban farm plots. 
Um, and you can see in this picture, we have um, an apple cider event in the fall where we have this old apple um, press and press apples to make apple cider. And so we do lots of um, community engagement events such as a maple syrup boil down, an Earth Day event, um, a spring seedling sale, um, and then regular work days throughout the season to bring people into this the cycles of nature and really understanding how food is grown. Um, it's very easy when you're in an urban environment to be very out of touch with your food and, and what a farm is and means and looks like. Um, so that's just kind of some context for um, our project and our farm space. In terms of project updates, so we found out several years ago, or not several years ago, we found out recently um, that just due to all the construction in Somerville and in the area, our urban farm is going to need to be moved because they're going to essentially be straightening out the road and the road will go right through where the farm is right now. Um, so this map is just a sketch that the city has given us to show. It shows essentially building C and this road is kind of where our farm space is now. Um, and then civic space C at the bottom right corner is kind of where they've said um, we will eventually be moving to. So, so far we've been in communication um, with different um, partners and folks at the city of Somerville to just gain more information about when this will take place and where we'll be moving and what specifications of the site are. So this just shows another image of um, the initial site that we were gonna be moving to was Civic Space 2 up in the top right corner. But after some um, like sun studies and wind studies, it's looking like we'll be moving to Civic Space C down in the left-hand corner. Um, <clears throat> we were at the Sasaki Charette. We, worked on, this is kind of one of our initial sketches of just working on kind of thinking through what are the components of our existing space that are really critical to our programs and operations. So we kind of sketched out and, and did a kind of a, a walkthrough of what happens on the farm in each different season. So spring, summer, fall, and winter, um, kind of the movement of, our operations and our programs. And so some of the really core components right now are our raised bed spaces where we're growing our produce. Um, we have an outdoor classroom space where we do all of our food justice and environmental justice workshops with our high school youth, along with host public events and hold um, other farm-based workshops for the community. Um, another core component of our space is our pollinator garden and our two beehives. So we're really wanting to think about how, how are we an urban oasis and not just growing produce, but also um, part of an ecosystem and reminding um, the people who are coming to our farm space that it's really important um, that no space exists in isolation and that we're part of a broader ecosystem. And so incorporating pollinator spaces. Um, kind of another update of where we are. This was another sketch from the charrette. Um, was a lot of, we're kind of in the process of really determining, you know, we, it is a really a bummer and a lot of work to think about moving farm spaces. We've been on this land since 2014. And so you can imagine there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of, um, yeah, just real living trees and plants and things that are not going to just be easy to pick up and move. Um, however, I think we are really trying to approach this as this is going to be happening in the new future. And so how can we, um, how can we make the most out of what's happening and how can we 
try to see the silver lining in this. And so we're trying to think about ways that we would like to expand our existing space and how can we um, how can we imagine ways that we can um, add new compo components to the farm in order to better serve our community, in order to grow our farm space? Um, so some things include um, having more pollinator corridors. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, an outdoor kitchen space, um, more of a public community space with a shade structure a larger greenhouse space to be able to grow seedlings and open that up to the community. Um, community compost bins where people can come and bring their compost as well as learn about how, um, how plants decompose and how that's broken down over time to add that back into the soil. Um, a wash station where we can um, yeah, more easily clean and prepare and wash all the vegetables that we grow. And then also a farm stand. Um, so being able to sell produce directly from our farm. Um, right now, all of our produce goes to both the mobile market, but then also neighborhood produce, which is a local grocery store. And then we donate the rest to different food pantries. And so we have thought it would be really great to have a farm stand right on site where people would be able to um, just walk by the farm, enjoy the space and then take home tomatoes with them. So these are some of the ideas that we've come up with in terms of how, um, how we would ideally like to see the farm expand. Um, some of our pro project outcomes. Um, I think this process has been really helpful for us in order to emphasize really like all the different valuable components of the existing space to show the city all the work that we've done to develop the farm and what a valuable resource it is for the community. Um, so I think it's been really important for us in this process to um, not just reflect on what we would like and, and down the road, what we want this new space to look like, but what have we created and what have we, have, what have we developed um, at our existing space and what's really crucial and critical um, for our programs and for the ways that we're um, serving the community right now. Um, so other kind of outcomes, envisioning the potential of the new site, um, which I talked about in the previous slide, and then graphics to show the need for more space and how we need to integrate the flow between production, education, and ecology. Um, so I think this has been, really um, a helpful resource to kind of think about the movement of um, just our staff and our youth through the space and how we could um, how we could design a new space to to really help that flow better and to bring more people into the space. Um, this is just a snapshot of our project board that we've been working with Sasaki volunteers on. Um, really excited about. But this just kind of shows a glimpse of um, kind of envisioning what our new space would look like up at the top image and thinking about um, ways that it could feel even more open than it does now, having some lawn space. You can see the farm stand right up front, um, a greenhouse space, um, education space back there in the right, raised beds. Um, so really wanting to imagine how can this um, be really welcoming and inviting for people to stop by. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but um, this graphic, um, this small one with the yellow triangles, that kind of just shows um, kind of the way that we currently flow between our production, like our ecological spaces and our education and how um, how we would really benefit from having more space and more flow between those different areas. Um, and then last, just a couple of thoughts on what we would hope for the project impact. Um, really to demonstrate to the city of Somerville the importance of urban green and growing space in Somerville. Somerville is one of the most densely populated cities um, in New England. And so 
there's just a, a huge lack of public green space. And so we are really hoping through this project to, to demonstrate the value and the importance of this work and the benefit that it is for the community. Um, and then we're also hoping um, just to have really solid graphics and resources because um, we'll be submitting a proposal to the city um, when the RFP is out um, in order to hopefully acquire this new space. Um, and so we're really just trying to gain community input and um, kind of show not only the work that we currently do, but also how we envision that expanding and improving in the future. Um, and I will stop there and see if there's any, any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily. That was awesome. Um, we can do a, a congratulations. And then we do have one question so far in the chat. I wonder whether the city can help with some of these expanded ideas by incorporating pollinator pathways, for instance into other components of the area redesign and streetscapes, has the city so far been receptive to collaboration? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, I think that's partly why we wanted to include um, folks in the urban, um, like urban design and forestry department at the city early on. Um, and I would say there are definitely some folks at the city that have been really receptive and excited um, and really um, want to be included on even on, on our like Sasaki project board and have input in this project. Um, so I am hopeful for that. I think part of it is they only have, you know, a lot of this is going to be left up to the to the developers. And so there's only kind of so much that our, our partners at the city are going to be able to support us and advocate for us, but we're hopeful. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from this group? Feel free to put them in the chat for those of you online. Okay, wonderful. Emily, that was great. Thank you so much. And we are going to, um, anybody who has questions, send them on over and we'll get them over to Emily and the team over at Groundwork. Um, and this is ongoing. So you have lots more time to work with these teams. Um, I'm just gonna double check. Thank you, Emily. Um, that There's nobody here from, hold on one second. I want to bring my slides back up. Um, I want to bring the one that's already shared. Oh no. Okay. Is there anybody here from combating green infrastructure? I don't believe I saw anybody. Okay, perfect. So for those of you who don't know, combating green infrastructure is a project in Chelsea. And they are working on making the case for what um, for affordable housing and green space coexisting and having co-benefits. And the fact that you do not have to have only affordable housing or only green space, but that the two can coexist. And specifically, they're looking at technical needs around what green roof infrastructure would look like on affordable housing um, buildings. So they will be looking for a little more help in March. The reason why they're not here today, they were going to try to join, uh, but they're a different tier of grant. They're an exploration grant. And so they're um, not required to do this mid grant presentation. That's why they're not here right now. Um, but for Sasaki folks, they will be asking for help uh, in, a, in about a month. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, and now looking forward, we just announced our call for proposals for 2023 yesterday officially. Uh, so if you know of anybody who is might be a, a community group you volunteered with or somebody in your neighborhood that is in greater Boston or in one of the gateway cities in Massachusetts, please send them the call for proposals. All Sasaki employees should have received that call yesterday. Uh, and anybody who was a partner who didn't receive it, let me know and I will send it to you. Um, the call for proposals ends on May 3rd. That's the due date to apply. And we it's uh, the same prompt as last year, shared voices charting a course for community action. 
people can go right to our website as well. But if, if folks don't know, they're like, oh, I'm a little intimidated to write a grant proposal, that's completely understandable. We have lots of information sessions. Uh, so through um, the month of months of April and March, we'll have in-person and virtual sessions that folks can join us at, ask lots of questions. We have a mixer. If you've got a community group that has a really cool idea about what they want to do, um, they might need a partner with a different skill set then they can come together and hopefully meet one another at that mixer and see if they might want to do that project together. So we've got lots of stuff coming. May 3rd is the deadline to submit applications. And June 1st will be the design grants pitch night right here in this room. Uh, and then on June 23rd, all of you Sasaki folks and SEED employees, please put this on your calendar because we'll have this cohort of grantees final presentation. So you'll get to see where they were today and then the, where they are in a few months, which will be really great. Um, and I think with that, I'll stop sharing. Were there any other questions, comments, thoughts? All right. Thank you all so much. This has been really great.